Thank you for joining us uh, for the Freshman Success Around the Country panel. Um, my name is Adelric McCain. I'm the Director of Equity and National Impact at the Network for College Success at the University of Chicago. Prior to that, I was a classroom teacher, um, teacher leader for 12 years, both on the south side and west side of Chicago. Um, and prior to that, long time ago, I was a ninth grade student at a comprehensive high school in Bloomington, Minnesota. And I vividly remember um, not feeling seen uh, and not feeling acknowledged. Um, and after I received um, some poor grades, um, I, I felt that it was better, uh, that I would be more welcomed at the pool hall across town um, and at some other people's homes. Now I had to pay, you know, dearly for that and my, uh, to pay those dividends in my junior year to pull my GPA back up. Um, but it really informs my why when I think about this work. Um, I really think that every student should feel seen um, and their brilliance should be acknowledged. And we know that all of our children have brilliance and it's, they're looking for adults to actually tap into that brilliance. So that's my why. And I am joined today with some amazing colleagues, some, some brilliant colleagues that I've cherished working with. And some of our work has spanned uh, for the past eight years. I've been working with uh, some of the colleagues on this call. And I know um, we're gonna have a great conversation. I'm looking forward to joining um, them in this conversation. Um, so with me, I'm going to get them to introduce themselves, uh, but with me is uh, Dr. Asia Carpenter, uh, Dr. Karen Baran, Elizabeth Kirby, and Habib Bangra. Um, and I'm going to ask you guys to introduce yourselves, but I'm going to ask you, what is your why when you think about freshman success work? What is your why behind this work? So let's start with Asia. Good morning, everyone. I am Dr. Asia Carpenter, a director in the School District of Philadelphia who um, coordinates or connects the ninth grade work from central office with schools and through programming. My why is um, I'm a product of the School District of Philadelphia. I had the opportunity to go to one of the more popular schools, um, not only in the city, but in the school, in the, in the state and across the state, Philadelphia High School for Girls, where I had an amazing opportunity to transition in and through high school pretty successfully and almost seamlessly. It was a lot about the, the loving that happened when I came into ninth grade. There were some areas that I was um, not feeling super confident about, but with the, the work of the staff, it was a, a positive transition for me on top of having that time at home and that support at home. But there are a lot of students who don't have that. And knowing that times are not easy or, and aren't getting any easier for students, being able to really um, support work that supports students is super important. I want students that look like me and who look like others to have the opportunity to transition so that they can have success and at least have a fighting chance to get along in the world in a way um, that isn't so easy these days. So that's my why. Thank you. Karen? Hello everyone, I'm Karen Baran. I'm the principal of West High School. My why is that every child deserves post-secondary success, every single one of them. Um, I'm a person of privilege and I wanna make sure that every child has the same opportunities I had. The other why for the work though is I saw freshmen on track work transform my high school in Chicago and I saw it transform opportunities for hundreds of kids and families. And um, I'm, uh, I have to say, it's been one of the most exciting transitions I've, I've seen. So um, I'm totally all in. Thank you. Liz? <clears throat> so great to be here, uh, back with my, um, Network for College Success friends and former CPS colleagues. Um, you know, my why for this work really goes back to actually knowing the stories of students who I have worked with both as a teacher, but also as an administrator and seeing the difference that an, an intentional approach to the on-track work made 
in, a, in very clear ways for those students. So knowing that there are students now who have graduated high school who would not have graduated and would have got lost in the tracks, cracks. Um, knowing that there are students who are now in college or who have graduated college who if we were doing high school the way it had been done for 100 years, they would not have had those opportunities or there would have been many more obstacles to get there. So that is, that is my why. I think the freshman on track work helped all of us to understand uh, developmentally where freshmen were and the structures that we need to have in place to ensure that they get off to a strong start in high school and it's life changing. Thank you, Liz. Habib? All right. Um, greetings, everyone. My name is uh, Habib Bangora. I'm the uh, Director of Data Analytics with uh, the Center for High School Success, which is a project of um, Stanford Children. Uh, I'm going to follow uh, uh, Dell's structure. Prior to that, I was a, a National Director of Implementation and Continuous Improvement within the same organization where I helped lead the expansion of our work across six states, 100 plus schools, um, about 60 or so school districts. Um, my why um, is, if you're wondering where I got this like really powerful and exotic name from, I'm an immigrant from, uh, from Sierra Leone. Um, and my why has to relate back to my experience of making the transition from eighth grade to ninth grade as a newly arrived immigrant in this country and how I went from eighth grade in the United States <clears throat> identified as a gifted student, being recommended to uh, sit for exams to go into uh, some of the more prestigious exam schools in my, in my region, to getting to ninth grade and being put into a learning disabled track um, on the basis that um, the adults in my building, in my, in my high school, just could not believe that a kid who just came from Sierra Leone a couple of months back uh, was smart enough um, to be um, in a gifted track at, at the high school level. So they placed me there and it took about six months of me advocating for myself as four, at 14 years old for them to finally realize the mistake they made and put me back not on an advanced track, but on the regular track. And it was there that I began to see how um, the decisions that governed um, who got what in high school were based uh, to a large degree on race and social class, right? Because all the kids in the quote unquote regular uh, track were like black and brown kids like myself, right? And the curriculum was no more rigorous than the curriculum that I experienced when I was in the learning disabled track, right? So I got disillusioned and disengaged very early on in ninth grade when I realized how arbitrary some and, and biased these decisions were. And it took my mom intervening two years later after like having earning a combined 1.667 GPA my freshman and sophomore year because I'd resigned to the fact that, you know what? If the decisions about where I could go and what I could become are based on my race, then there's no point in making the effort, right? So I decided in ninth grade, I was going to end up in community college at best because that's where everybody else went. Um, but my mom's intervention got me into a better school where my, my, my experience improved and my outcomes and my grades improved, not because they did anything magical, but because of Dave Doughty, right? And Dave Doughty was this gentleman, he was my basketball coach, who I did everything I could to not disappoint him, including study, do my homework, and get my stuff together. So to me, what I've sought to do since my experience with Dave Dottie, he's now a life mentor of mine, is like, I was lucky to run into him, right? So now my mission is about how do I institutionalize luck, right? So that the next kid doesn't have to rely on luck to be able to get to where I am right now. So thank you all, and I, look, I very much look forward to this conversation. Thank you all. Um, I think it's extremely apparent that we are in set for a really rich and a meaningful conversation, especially at these times right now when we think if some people have already started up school and some of us are looking right down very quickly to be starting up school. Uh, I'm grateful. Um, here's how we're going to, to do this panel. Um, I'm going to address uh, some questions uh, directly to some of our panelists. Um, but if anybody on the panel has either a follow up or something to respond, we're going to allow uh, that uh, space and time for that as well. Um, and again, we're looking for this to be a conversation. There's going to be a time to put your questions and questions and answer um, and the question answer uh, function of the Zoom call. Um, and let's just jump right into it. Um, and so the first question is going to go to Asia. Um, from your perspective, what is the importance of having a successful ninth grade team 
or a ninth grade academy? And what are the crucial parts uh, when we're thinking about a successful program? What are, the, what are those crucial parts? Absolutely. So the most important part of having a ninth grade academy, or the importance is to build these relationships with students early. You've heard um, Dell and Habib talk about, and even myself talk about how important it was to come into a space and in an essence, feel like you belong. High school is a challenge to come to transition from the middle school where, you know, kind of not anything goes, but you have a lot more leeway with grading structures and you formulated these friendships over a period of four years, you know, big fish to little fish. And having a team of folks around you who can support you and kind of embrace you, give you those hugs along the way is critical. Um, in terms of the components of ninth grade, having a team of folks, teachers, and adults in the building who can rally around ninth grade is really important. Having um, opportunities for the adults who are rallying around the students to meet together to discuss the students and come up with strategies for engagement, for intervention, um, and for good practices that support them transitioning not only um, social emotionally, but as also academically. And then, um, kind of start, starting that community feeling, supporting the, the cultural aspects of Ninth Grade Academy uh, that remind students that I do belong here, that I do, that I, get, I can get support and there are people I can go to. Um, so facilitating all of those pieces are the critical components of a, a successful Ninth Grade Academy. Thank you, Asia. Does anybody have anything they'd like to either add or build off of? I think the only thing I would add, absolutely yes, Asia, 100%. But the thing that we found is that there also had to be consistent data, and Habib, you may want to talk about this, but consistent data structures where not only we uh, teachers could hold their colleagues accountable, but they could hold, we could all, everybody could hold each other accountable for individual student success. Right, and I, uh, yeah. I 100% agree with that. And the other thing that I think is really important, because um, I know, you know, folks in education, we have, uh, like, we've been traumatized with the whole data talk, right? So, like, folks, literally, I've seen folks go through the, you know, stages of grief when we introduce data in conversation, right? But data is indispensable to this work, right? It's not a nice to have, it's a must have, right? And especially in the period that we're in um, nationally, and, and I, would, uh, I would argue globally, um, data, it removes bias from the conversations that you're having about students, right? Because if you're not using data to highlight who needs support and what kinds of supports they need, then you're relying on your gut, on your assumptions to make decisions on um, who needs support and where to direct your supports. And oftentimes, bias, that's where bias creeps in um, and so on and so forth, right? And that's where we, we end up neglecting groups of students who are not finding success in our schools because at the aggregate level, we're 95% on track rate. Well, who are the 5% that, uh, that aren't on track? What do they look like, right? And we found that predictably, they look the same, right? They're black, brown, poor, ELL, SPED, you all know the scripts, right? So data is absolutely, absolutely important um, in this work. And I appreciate Asia really highlighting the mindsets uh, of, of, of members of the team. I think there also needs to be additional consideration to the right mindset to actually look at the data because we know that while the, the the data is just giving you facts for you to interpret how people interpret that those facts are dependent upon the mindsets they're bringing to look at that data as well so uh, I appreciate you guys surfacing that let's let's move to uh, uh, Karen um, how has uh, your work, how, what, what, what's your work look like as far as adapting uh, freshman success work in this virtual environment? Um, what does a launch of freshmen on track look like possibly virtually? And, and what are some of the things, essential things that you're considering right now as you think about uh, switching this work or, or, or transitioning, uh, continuing with the work, but switching over to a virtual platform? I have to say COVID-19 struck on um, March 13th for us, and I'm going to be honest, 9OT went out the window. It, it did. And um, uh, so one of the, uh, one of the things, uh, we had started success teams um, 
So I was seven years in um, Chicago as a building leader, and this is uh, uh, my fourth year at Madison. And so um, the first thing I want to say is you can't just take the beautiful systems that worked in one school and plop them in the other school. It doesn't work. It's not a program. You got to build the people. And it took every day of three years to build the people. But because of COVID-19, because of the public murder of George Floyd, we are seeing that we have changed mindsets dramatically. And it is very exciting now. We have systems and track for six virtual success teams. Every child in my building has an adult mentor. Obvious, but we never, there's 2,300 kids. We never thought about it before. We are eliminating pullout honors in ninth grade this year for algebra. And I, that is significant because much to Habib's story, if you're a black or brown kid, the likelihood that you're in a pullout honors class in my building is almost nil. And that's gotta go. And so what happened because of the changes that have happened this spring is that collectively, not only the teachers in my building, but the teachers in the high school across my district have said no to pull out honors. And so we're going to spend this year to develop the performance assessments, et cetera, so that all kids have the opportunity to earn, or earn honors organically within their regular education classroom and therefore move up academically in a way that is unrelated to their socioeconomic, their race, their ESL, their special education status. I think that um, in the past when we reached out to parents, we did it through email and we invited them to come to meetings. The white parents showed up. So one of the things that we're learning is that you need multiple, so obvious, but you need multiple forms of communication. You have to provide opportunities to go into the community, invite people into their spaces and have conversations with them about their school. Um, I could go on, but I know my colleagues are also thinking about COVID-19 as well, and I'm really interested to hear what they are thinking and learning. I'd just like to say, Dr. Brand, thank you for your vulnerability, because I think sometimes even in our spaces of education, it's hard for us to say some of the things, that are the critical pieces of our work that are reality, but to be vulnerable, thank you very much for that. That's offering a gift for us. So, um, Karen opened up the, the, the conversation for us. What, what else, how are you experiencing freshmen on track work in, in this virtual space? Well, for me, um, I was just starting to introduce, I'm a superintendent of a district right outside of Cleveland, Ohio, about 5,000 students, one high school. So it's been really interesting going from 360,000 plus 100 high schools to 5,001 high school, but I will tell you, it, it's just as busy, actually. Um, and so one of the things I know that I wanted to really introduce to our high school was this freshman on track work. Um, and was, we were just, it's, it's helpful for me to hear from you, Karen, that it took you three years, because I just wanted to bring all the toolkits, just bring the toolkits, we'll build the data, we'll be on track. And so I'm learning that you have to really build the culture around it. You have to build the data culture. You have to get folks excited. You have to build their knowledge base in order to really launch that. Now, I will say, uh, I have members of, of the high school team go to some of the fresh, go to one of the freshman success visits. We were gonna do another one before COVID. And they came back very excited and were talking about bees are better like two days after they came back. So I don't know what you guys did in those success visits, but they were on board. Um, but it's still a process that, that we're building out because, um, because I've learned, you know, in Chicago, you have to make sure you have those structures in place um, to make sure that you're successful um, in those outcomes. As it relates to COVID, um, you know, I was taking notes as you were talking, Karen, because I'm trying to figure out what, what does this look like when you're just starting to launch it um, and you don't have that, that type of uh, on-track indicator um, in our district or our state as of yet. So, um, but I know that uh, COVID has really forced all of us to pay attention to the students, actually to all students, because we're hearing more about, about the multiple needs that we all have, um, but also to, also to make sure that we're pay, paying attention to the students that we are likely to lose. 
Um, and so, um, so that I think will help us as we continue to get the work going to pay attention to, you know, what happened in the spring, where I think actually in our district, um, you know, there was a lot of flexibility around grades and grading. So that probably helped stem some of the failure that would have just come under a normal, normal circumstance. But this year we're going to something more traditional, though we're starting remote as well. So we'll need to make sure we have those structures built in, or at least start to get those built in. Thank you. Um, I, I think, um, go sorry, go ahead, Asia. Okay, um, so one thing I learned, back to the original point of what's necessary, don't forsake the gathering of the community. So the structure here is that we have um, a, a pool of administrators. We have 28 administrators who work with ninth grade academies here. Um, and they kind of manage the, the ninth grade academy with teams of teachers, protocols, with the data like Habib was saying. And even during COVID, even though grading practices kind of went out the window, even though everybody was scrambling for what to do, those APs, their, their assistant principals, the team of 28 people were like, hey, Asia, we need to get together. Hey, Asia, what are we doing about such and so? Or do you know how to, or how do we look at this data to give us more information, even though attendance is not being, you know, accounted for in the same way, and even though grading practices have changed. They have understood, come to understand, because we've been socializing this for the last three, four years, that coming together to talk about ninth graders is critical. And as a result, they pass it on to their team who meet on a very regular basis. Like, we have to do what we have to do for ninth graders. So to Karen's point, you know, calling home, I might have dropped off an Uber gift card for you just so I can make sure that I keep engaging you so that you keep in touch with me. Um, counselors on board, setting up their own social emotional classrooms to check in with kids. And so kids who may, may not normally have an opportunity to get to a council because, you know, you know, large caseloads had a way to directly connect with adults via this virtual platform, get a pretty much immediate response and stay connected. So the, the connection piece has been um, integral to the work of ninth grade um, on track because they've been tracking, they, you know, nothing's perfect at this point. We're still trying to figure it out, but they haven't stopped the conversation. They haven't stopped the care and they have not um, relinquished the idea that relationships with each other as adults and with kids is um, critical, critical mass. Thank you for highlighting that, Asia, because I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk about how essential collaboration is with this work. And I think that that's key because one thing, while we might not always be in person, we, the technology has allowed us the opportunity to still collaborate, and that's so key. Habib, you were about to say? Yeah, so I just want to double click on what um, Asia and Karen and, um, and, and Liz have shared. Um, by just saying that, like, relationships, like, don't forsake the power of relationships, right? Uh, I think relationships are more critical now than at any other point in our education system, right? If not for any other reason, but for the fact that COVID and the fact that most schools are going virtual or hybrid, it shifted the balance of power between in the relationship between students and teachers. Literally now, students can opt in or out of your classroom and not get in trouble. In a physical setting, if I put my head down, you might, you know, give me some kind of demerit or whatever the case may be. In a virtual setting, if I'm not connecting with you, I am tuning out, right? So teachers, it's really, and it's, it's doable. And I know that the reality is kids have been online and they've been virtual way before like COVID, right? We, the adults are the ones that are late to the game, right? But there are ways to make genuine connections with people in a virtual setting, right? And to me, a, a really great example is, uh, maybe it's a little bit extreme, but I think it's applicable and it's something we can learn from it, right? If, if you think about Beyonce and the Bayhives, like right? these people have never met Beyonce before, but they will fight you <laughs> for saying, you understand what I mean, right? So don't tell me as an adult that, oh, well, I can't build relationships with students because I don't know them, they're eighth graders, they're new to my school, and it's virtual. It is doable. And we as adults do it all the time, right? We, I connect with random people on LinkedIn that I build relationships with virtually, right? Do not forsake the power of relationship, relationships. It's more important this year than at any other point. And I, um, in, in some ways, this is one of the civil linings of, of COVID is that it's forcing educators to pay greater attention to relationship building. 
Habib, I really appreciate that um, popular culture analogy. I, I think it landed perfect. <laughs> um, Liz, you were talking um, about starting this work in your current context as a superintendent. Um, I'd like you to maybe talk a little bit more about what the, the lessons from, from, from your time in Chicago, um, what resonated you the most, with you the most while picking up this work in your current context? Well, I had to remember that in Chicago, we started the work slowly. So we didn't jump on, in a freshman on track in 2006 and everyone was on it. There was some piloting of uh, some structures. Um, and then eventually it became a part of the accountability for high schools. Uh, there is a community of educators that were working in these issues, you know, um, kind of a, a pilot group but within the, with the network for college success where we could start exploring this work and exploring the challenges. Um, we had a research base that undergirded all of the work. So people um, had some comfort that they were working towards outcomes that would make a difference in the students' lives. Um, we had communities of practice where, uh, you know, eventually data analysts were working together principals were working together in small groups um, and the network for college success, you know, was facilitating actually across different types of stakeholders, um, the work too as well. So there, there was a lot of, um, and, it's, and then it was, you know, it happened over time too. So, you know, I remember when I was first a principal, I thought that a 70% on track rate, this was in 2007 or eight. Well, that was pretty good in Ohio <laughs> then. I'm in Ohio. See, I'm getting confused. I'm, I've been using my CBS email here and my, and then I'm switching. Um, but yeah, we're 70% in Chicago is a pretty good rate, but we know right now that's, you know, I mean, I'm sure the district is probably over 90% freshman on track at this point, which is amazing. Um, so it's been helpful for me to think through the different components that I've experienced at different levels of the district so I can kind of plug and play um as we develop it at the high school i think ultimately it will be easier to do to do at one high school but quite frankly i'm interested in spreading this work you know across high schools in northeast ohio because in our state there's a very heavy penalty um a fiscal penalty actually based upon performance on things like graduation rate um like sat and act performance and, and ohio schools are graded and you know, if you receive a certain grade, you can uh, money's taken out of your district to fund vouchers. So it's not Illinois. So <laughs> so there's a, there's a, a there's actually more urgency in Ohio um, to get this work work going. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Karen. Um, I with full transparency, I had the privilege of uh, serving as a coach. Uh, when Karen was principal at Hancock High in Chicago and Liz was the chief at that time. Um, so I don't know if you wanted to add anything as far as some something that the Chicago lessons that resonated with you as you're thinking about your work in Madison. In Chicago, I had a little tiny, tiny school on the southwest side that was 96% Latinx. Diversity was which Mexican state you came from. Now I'm in Madison, Wisconsin at a very high achieving school. We are a five-star school, significantly exceeds expectations, unless you're black or brown, right? And so one of the reasons why I was so interested in Madison is the um, academic gap between white students and black and brown students. It's the greatest in the city of the high schools and it's the greatest in the state, and Wisconsin has the greatest white-black achievement gap in the country. So I knew that I was moving to the epicenter of where ninth grade on track was needed most. The hardest thing to do is to change a successful school mm. because at least 50% of the people are like, what are you talking about? This is great, my kid's a presidential scholar, they're going to Harvard. And um, so I would say that one of the biggest changes was assuming that everybody was on board, that all kids, first thing we have to do is ensure that all kids achieve post-secondary success. And um, the challenge is that 
people agree with that theoretically, but when you ask them to give up privilege or to change practices, that's a little different. Um, and that really is the greatest challenge I face, is trying to um, have everybody understand that if um, one child fails, we all fail. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Habib, you have a unique position where you've been able to see the work grow on both coasts and in between. Um, from your vantage point, um, um, what does the work look like outside of Chicago? What, 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 what have you seen? Um, I, I think it's, it's a mixed bag, right? So I think a lot of us are following Chicago's lead, right? And states, cities, districts are trying frantically to replicate what um, happened in Chicago, um, and, but tailoring it to the context that is specific to where they are. What we do as an organization is basically preach the fundamentals, right? So I think there's some guardrail fundamentals, what we call uh, condition setters, um, that we've seen in the numerous times we've been in Chicago and the conversations we've had with you all and the, and the coaching that we've uh, received from you. Um, there's some fundamentals that need to be in place at the district level and at the school level that we think set the condition for successful implementation, right? At a very high level, it's really important. It helps, um, though it's not we've seen districts and localities do it without this being in place, but it helps when uh, freshman on track becomes an accountability metric, right? Because what gets measured, people tend to pay attention to and resources tend to follow. So uh, second to that, uh, in, addition to, or in addition to freshman on track being an accountability metric, uh, having someone at the district level that is specifically responsible for overseeing implementation at the school level Right, because there are conditions that need to be put at the, uh, in place at the school level that require district level support. Right? And that person, we, see, we find that they're most effective when this is someone that's high enough in the leadership chain that they report to the superintendent, right? so that there's some real accountability behind it. Um, and then at the school level, level, it's about providing schools with the autonomy to make the structural sh shifts necessary to implement this correctly. Right? So having an administrator that, that oversees ninth grade on track in your building, uh, making sure that you have um, uh, um, PD, not PD time, but uh, uh, what am I talking about? Meeting time, right? So uh, cross collaborative meeting time that allows teachers across disciplinary team of teachers to meet on a regular basis. We advocate at least twice monthly um, to have constructive conversations about how they can support students that are based on data, right? Um, and ensuring that your schools have the data that they need in a timely manner, right? So we talk about it as having um, real-time, actionably formatted data, right? And schools cannot do this if districts do not provide a student information system that actually gives them that. So if you are a school district that has a student information system that uh, hails back to the No Child Left Behind days, chances are your, your SIS does not provide timely data for your educators, right? Or at best, your data people are giving your educators spreadsheets that they have to pour through. And by the time they, they figure out how to, what data points to look at, time's up and the meeting's over. So districts need to be able to set that condition. Uh, teams, uh, schools need to have teams. They need to have a ninth grade team lead. Uh, ideally that has a reduced caseload so that they can organize the logistics of ninth grade team and facilitate constructive conversations about um, which, which students need the support and how best to support them. Uh, we, uh, we also preach advocate for advisories because we know that the reason students struggle in ninth grade has less to do with the uh, increase in rigor academically. It has more to do with them just lacking or not having fully developed socio-emotional skills to be able to navigate their expectations, both academic and socio-emotionally, of their new academic setting. So advisories are a place where you can embed uh, a structured, vetted, uh, SEL curriculum, but also use that as a place where students can do makeup work um, and build relationships with further, like strengthen relationships with teachers, right? And at the ninth grade level, it's about how do we personalize the experience for young people, right? So ninth grade academies are one way to do that. And we've had ninth grade academies. There was a move around this for a really long time, but it was it was preached, I think, in a lot of ways. It was promoted as a standalone intervention. What what we've learned from our visits in Chicago is that. The reason you all have been impactful in doing this work is that um, you created a coherent system of, of structures and activities, right? So ninth grade academies uh, are sort of macro level personalization. Advisories are another level. Um, 
teacher-student relationships and ninth grade teams, right? So if these things align and cohere, right, then there's greater likelihood that you can quickly identify the young people who need supports and the families who need supports, and you're able to provide responsive supports for those families who need to rise. Um, so again, we preach the fundamentals, and then we go in and coach the, the teams on, on the adaptive nature um, of the work in terms of the shifting mindsets and all that other stuff. And I, I just want to have to say, like, we start everything with the why, right? Like, we do not allow you, we do not invite folks into our net, welcome folks into our network until you've gone through our institute, where we drill down on the, on the research-based why we do the work. Um, and then we encourage schools to, like, strategically place teachers in ninth grade that you know have the mindset and the empathy ne uh, needed to be able to work with ninth graders, because I think it takes a special kind of person to understand and love and be able to uh, support ninth graders. And it's really important to go away from the model where we, the teachers we don't want touching our 12th graders, the ones we throw into the ninth grade. I, I think we need to flip that paradigm so that your best teachers are the ninth grade. Well, just thank you for saying that. <clears throat> thank you for saying that very plainly. Um, Asia, I don't know if you wanted to add anything from the Philadelphia context. It's a lot of what Habib said, um, trying to replicate, but specify to our district. So we have a lot of the practices that we've learned about when we come to, you know, um, events in Chicago. Um, and we're really just trying to pare down and really address this adaptive mindset. We have pools in place. We have structures for meetings. We have leaders. We've carved, carved out this space and essentially this time. Um, most, most teams have weekly meetings, if not two times a week where they can talk about ninth graders. So we have many of the pieces in place, not all the pieces my team would like, but we have many of the pieces, the critical pieces in place. However, we are still working on getting the right teachers in ninth grade, which would make a leap of a difference because a lot of times the, we, we still think that 12th grade is the most important piece um, because we're counting graduation rates. I get it. But this is a front loading that has to happen and there we, for we need our strongest teachers who want to teach ninth grade in ninth grade to be point. So I won't belabor that. Um, so I think we are working. We're at a point where we kind of have our, all of our tools socialized and we understand what they're for, how to use them. Um, but moving forward in terms of the interventions that we actually provide for students and that follow through process. And then the other piece is getting folks on board with the concept that ninth graders are important. Yes, they're challenging, but they're important and they need that extra special love that a caring adult can give who wants to be with ninth graders. So there's kind of some, there's two le levels. There's like systemic change that has to happen in terms of how we place teachers, and then helping folks understand that ninth grade really is the most important year in terms of impacting the graduation rate in four years. But because we like, um, you know, immediate feedback or outcomes, we always look at 12th graders. I'm gonna pull some questions because we have a few Q and A's um, from our, our, our um, colleagues and participants. Um, and um, the way I'm going to do this, I'm just going to throw out some questions. Uh, we're going to try our best not to bump heads, but if it happens, we'll roll with it. Um, and one of the first questions kind of go along with uh, where, where we're going with the conversation around data. Um, and one of the con conversations comes from Mr. Espinoza, who asks, uh, what are the key performance indicators that are most relevant to look at and at what frequency? So whoever wants to pick that up from their pers perspective. And if you don't mind, I'm actually gonna just kind of, just give, with, with time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to couch another question in there. So what are the key performance indicators that are most relevant to look at and at what frequency? And the follow-up is too, is that how do you ensure uh, that you have quality data? I think I can talk about it from a school standpoint and then um, the rest of you can talk at a larger standpoint. Um, we bi-weekly grade polls have been very uh, key for us. Um, we look at which teachers have a failure rate below a particular cut point and have conversations with them to go on. Um, uh, in my building currently, the first year I was there, it was 25%, then 20% failure rate. Um, uh, but essentially what it, what it does is it gives the teacher an opportunity to have a conversation to say, um, you know, Karen um, isn't doing this, Karen isn't doing that, Karen isn't whatever. And then for you to have, as an administrator, to have the coaching conversation to say, let's help you work through these challenges. Here are systems and st structures. We have that. 
we're going to take another look in two weeks and see how Karen is doing. And so we hold them accountable in a regular, predictable um, structure. I think that's really important. The other thing that we have done borrowing from Chicago is to look at the risk and opportunity index. And we use that to sort through our data to check and see. So this was a high opportunity kid who now is vulnerable. What's going on? What's our support? What are we missing? So I would say those are the uh, two things that really leap out that have really made a difference in both my buildings with respect to on-track performance. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, here in Philadelphia, we look at the attendance rate um, alongside of course grades. So we're kind of, we're looking for B's or better, but we're specifically looking for those students who are C and D because they're at risk of failing. I um, mean, that's what we don't want. You can't, uh, you know, accrue your credit if you are uh, failing. So when we look at attendance, kind of to Karen's point, we don't use the high risk, um, the risk opportunity metric, but we do look at students who, for example, are 80% present in school, because essentially that means you're here four out of five days in a week and the student is showing up. What are we doing with the students? So that's one measure we use. And then those students who are showing up 80%, but who may be on the cusp of failing. Those are our two biggest indicators. Really briefly, I would just add, um, not only do I wanna do the ninth grade on track work, but we're also building out towards the college, enrollment in college persistence piece. So the GPA focus is really uh, key and critical. And sometimes when you're starting the on track work, you can forget that because you're just trying to get the kids passed. But um, it's also an opportunity to start building really strong grade point averages for those. So for those who are starting this work, now um, you should couple both of those focus areas. I would suggest. Liz, Liz, I so appreciate that you said that because there was a question in there too about the correlation and the, the connection between um, freshman on track and college persistence. And so thank you for speaking towards that because I definitely know that that's there and, it, it, and I think we can talk more about that. But I do want to get to a couple other questions um, that, um, um, uh, you know, are, are some, some, so this one's a kind of a heavy hitter. So, so, how do you make sure that the biases are not replicated in the data systems themselves? Now, this was directly kind of addressed to, to, for, for me, but I think anybody can open up for, for this as well. Uh, wow, that's a good, <laughs> that's a good question. It um, sounds like, um, sounds very specific and personal to that uh, the person asking the question. But I would say generally, so like, you know, if you deal with data, if, you, if, you, if, if your job requires showing data to people, the first question, thing that people do is to question the validity of the data, right? And what I say, the data that you have is the data that you have, right? So to, to the extent that data is dirty, right? It means that data input was dirty, right? So at this, and it starts at the school level, right? Um, how frequently, if it, do you, as, as, as a school building, uh, do you have a very specific policy on how frequently grades need to be put in? You have a very specific on what constitutes an A, B, C, D, or E, and do you check to make sure that folks are consistently adhering to that policy? Because your data system just shows you what people have put in, right? So if you want to start uh, to ensure data quality, right, it has to start with data input, and there has to be there have to be people at the school level who monitor data quality at the at the teacher input or at the attendance monitors uh, input level. Right, and then it's about how do we how do we share data with people, right? I, I think we have to have integrity in how we present data to people. When we present data to people, we don't try to use data to craft a particular story, right? We share your data with you, and we walk you through a protocol that helps you generate insights that are most pertinent to you. But generate insights in a way that ensures that you're not doing the comfortable look at data, right? So what people tend to do use what we see people do usually is. They come with assumptions about what's going on and they go look at the data to validate those assumptions. We say no. We say, look at the data, tell me objectively what you see, right? And we jump to no conclusions, we make no assumptions about it, but we walk you through a protocol of gain, generating objective insights on that, right? And, um, and we always tell people that this process that you just went through is incomplete, right? We want you to now go, you just looked at the, the quantitative data, we want you to now go look at the qualitative data that connects with that. Thank you. Does anybody want to add? I just want to do say we're, we're allow time for anybody want they want, if they want to add. But I do want to say that it's so important that we don't just stick with the hard quantitative data. That's so that qualitative data is sometimes um, 
it's not just a compliment, it is essential to better understand the quantifiable data. So thank you for highlighting that. Does anybody want to add anything? Okay, here's another heavy hitter question about, um, oof, I'm torn um, with time here. We'll say this, um, there's a question about how are you institutionalizing luck? And um, it kind of comes off that, that, that space because I think that that resonated with people, but I think that we're all doing work to um, uh, institutionalize luck or to list, make sure that we're creating cultures where uh, students aren't dependent upon a coach seeing them, but in fact that they are just, they are seen. What, um, what does the question mean by luck? I mean, I think it's, it's, it's stemming off of what Habib was saying in his narrative um, oh. that essentially um, to, to, to just rely on a student just getting that one teacher who sees them is probably not enough. How do you make that an institutionalized or a culture piece that every student's going to have somebody? Yeah. I think a big part of it is about talking to students, like talk to the kids, you know, if we start to, to um, collect the reasons that students do feel seen, um, how, how do we know that Habib is feeling connected? And so when we talk to them and we collect these practices, we can start to figure out how to make them a consistent ongoing practice and following up and holding folks accountable for the things that we expect. And when you hear what students say, even in the documentary that we saw earlier this week, kids were just looking to be seen um and so they might connect only with one person however that consistent the consistency of others saying hey habib or hey asia even if asia doesn't speak back today those habits of practice from what students are saying that they need to be and feel connected are how you start to institutionalize it and then build practices around those things that lend to students feeling connected or make students feel lucky to have encountered coach teacher administrator or whomever it is that is relating to them and, and attempting and making progress to connect. You will often hear students say, well, Dr. Carpenter is corny. Okay, I admit it. However, no matter how many times I kind of gave her attitude or no matter how many times I walked away or whatever, she still kept speaking. You know, my persistence impacted them. And you may not, you may not hear about it that year. You could just hear about it at the end of the story. It's like, you know, and that lady that was at the door every day, she was hype in the morning. She was always speaking and singing and calling my name from afar. But I remember, and I know that if not for that, I may not have ABC. So the institutionalization is collecting those practices, taking notes, meeting with students, allowing students their voice to share what they need, what they want, and then rallying around and planning together that teacher time, that building the culture of ninth grade, to, to figure out how we can make this an ongoing effort that we implement for our students so that they feel like they belong. Because everybody wants to feel like they belong to something in somewhere. And you come to school every day, you spend the most time in school, then you kind of spend anywhere else. And so this is a place above all other places that I need to feel like I, I have a place in this fabric. I think accountability, um breeds institutionalization. I think um, support breeds institutionalization and I think success breeds institutionalization. Yes, and I would add to it the thing that Asia, uh, both, of, both you and Liz, Asia, uh, Liz and Asia just said, is finding ways to institutionalize relationship building and staying on point and not letting you know how districts are, and no disrespect to districts anyways, but they sometimes feel like they've lost eyes on the, eye on the prize. And our job as school leaders and school professionals is to make sure that we are institutionalizing ways where relationships with kids are built and sustained and are meaningful. And that would be the link, I think, between the two of you. So I, I would just add to everything everyone just said, there's like really practical um, examples of how schools have done that. I, I think making it an expectation, I agree that adults build relationships with kids, right? And I think all of the, the, the things we've discussed around the fundamentals of how to do this work effectively are ways to institutionalize it. 
Um, very practically, uh, a really powerful exercise that I saw at two schools, one in Phoenix, Arizona, um, one in New York City, the ninth grade team, they put the names of every ninth grade on a post-it and they put it on the wall, right? And they had the ninth grade educators go up and they say, pull out the names of students with whom you have strong um, relationships, right? And they did that, right? And predictably, it's like there's two kinds of kids, right, that showed up, right? The kid that was the, the, the overachiever, right, self-advocate, they're going to do fine no matter what school you put them in. They, you know, teachers fall in love with those kids. They make you feel good about yourself. Their names were pulled. Um, incidentally, right, the kids who got in trouble a lot, <laughs> their names were pulled because they spend the most time in front of adults. And then you had about 70% of the school remaining, on, ninth graders remaining on the wall. And then the, the principal's task to the educators then was, like, we want you all to go pull names, like each adult, you're going to take five kids, and this will be your check and connect group. And every day, you will check and connect with these kids, even if it's just a hello, hi, bye, right? Um, and these are the kids that you will talk about. We will check um, when we have our meetings. You will talk about, hey, uh, I, have I seen this kid? Have I not seen this kid? Have I had a chance to check in with these, these kids? That automatically makes every single child in your school visible, right? So that's just an example of a very practical strategy for, again, like making kids uh, feel visible and seen in your ability. Thank you so much for this. Um, we are getting to that hour and there's so many questions left unanswered. So my hope is that somehow or another we can stay connected. Um, one piece that I would like to say that a lot of this work and a lot of this conversation um, will continue, um, not in this space, but um, we have a National Freshman Success Institute that meets annually. This year was our first year virtually. Um, and a lot of what we're discussing, we um, um, interact with, with, with uh, the why. Um, we talk about developing systems and structures. Um, and we also talk about the importance of meeting adolescents' needs um, through de the developing strong developmental relationships. So I wanted to get a chance to plug that out there for those who might want to still have, still have some questions out there that want to be answered. So please um, go to the Network for College Success website and you can see the information for our next Freshman Success Institute. I want to say sincerely, thank you to our panelists. I knew this was going to be a rich experience. Um, I just want to say that I appreciate you taking your time. I also want to appreciate our colleagues who are listening and watching. Um, I know that uh, those of us in education, we're very busy right now. And these are extraordinary times. So thank you for taking out a moment for, from my perspective, to engage in the work that really, really matters for our young people. So thank you, panelists, sincerely. And I hope that everybody has a wonderful, if you're already in the school year, I hope your school year goes wonderful. If you're about to kick it off, I hope you have a wonderful kickoff to the school year. And, and blessings to you all. Be well. <laughs>